The story of Joseph Pulitzer, a man who was born in Austria-Hungary in 1847 and rose to the pinnacle of success, is an inspiring example of the power of the will to do. St. Louis, Missouri, 1868. Two men are talking in the office of the Westlicher Post, a German-language newspaper. They are the renowned Karl Schurz and Dr. Emil Pretorius, fellow owners of the paper. I told Willick to come in and settle the matter about a new report. I can quite fathom his objections to Orenburg. The man's an A-number one reporter, but he seems to be set on young Pulitzer. I suppose he feels young Pulitzer is more pliable. But Joey Pulitzer has a mind of his own. Our Deutsche Gesellschaft Society made no mistake in helping that young man. I wish there were more like him. Ah, here you are, Willick. Good afternoon, Pulitzer. Good afternoon. Well, gentlemen, here he is, the Post New Reporter. Congratulations, Pulitzer. Going to black your fingers with printer's ink, eh? <laughs> well, I, an unknown, an emigrant selected for such responsibility, it is like a dream. But let me tell you, sir, I am not afraid. My ambition is to fill Mr. Willick's place <laughs> when he moves up, of course. Uh, all in good time, all in good time, Joey. Newspaper work calls for a long apprenticeship. But I mean to work hard. Tonight I'm going to work on my English. But the first lake of Post is a German newspaper. Yes, of course it is a German newspaper. But I didn't mean to talk so long. Of he does and gentlemen. Willick, there's a young man who will be a good newspaper man, or no newspaper man at all. Well, he'll do. I'll make a good wheel horse of him. Keep him on the right path. Uh, you may find yourself with a race horse instead of a wheel horse. This is the land of opportunity, we're told. And Joy Pulitzer has the nose of an opportunist. Joseph Pulitzer quickly progressed and soon sold the interest he had acquired in the Westlicker Post and purchased the St. Louis Dispatch, merging it with another paper, the St. Louis Post. And quickly, a powerful and profitable newspaper arose Phoenix-like from the ashes of two failures. Faced, ultimately, with a nervous collapse, Pulitzer left St. Louis for an extended stay in Europe. We find him just returned to the hotel where he and Mrs. Pulitzer are awaiting the boat. Do sit down and stop pacing, Joseph. And you might as well tell me. It's plain you're up to something. My dear Kate, I'm restless because I'm so eager for our sailing. You had another of your ideas. Well, the New York world is for sale. Oh, Joseph. I knew I'd never get you on that boat. And all those lovely clothes I was going to buy in Paris. But but the New York world. Joe, it sounds so expensive. $346,000. That's what Jay Gould wants. Must you take on so much responsibility? You know the doctor warned you about your nerves and your eyes. I know. But the New York world could do so much for the Democratic Party. I'd make it an organ for true Jeffersonian democracy. Uh, but am I the man for such a responsibility? No, I may not be equal to it. This isn't St. Louis. Joseph, what is that poem of gaiety you're so fond of quoting? For oh, that? Wealth lost, something lost. Must bestir myself to get more. Honor lost, much lost. Must win fame that the world may forget. Courage lost, all lost. Better thou hadst ne'er been born. You believe that, Joseph. It's your entire credo. Of course you must buy the world. Well, thank heavens it was you who was foolish enough to marry me, Kate. There aren't many wives who'd put up with such a disagreeable and changeable husband. <laughs> <laughs> and now, take me out to dinner. And I warn you, it must be very good to make up for those Paris frogs. The best champagne in New York. <laughs> we'll make it a feast as a reward for your wisdom and good counsel. <laughs> oh, I like the name of our newspaper, The World. It may be expensive, as you said, but it's going to be expensive, too. <laughs> world, a dull conservative paper, was revitalized. Circulation skyrocketed. But Pulitzer's active participation in its management was limited to four years. 
increasing physical suffering and warnings from the greatest physicians, drove him on a tour of the globe. In Constantinople, he is talking with one of his secretaries. This cable from Colonel Davis is most disturbing, Constantly. I will not tolerate often office dissension. Editors should be above such pettiness. Cables like this should not be allowed to fall into your hands. They are too upsetting. Nevertheless, I must know everything that goes on. It even drives me frantic not to receive the world until three weeks after it has been read at home. But you've built up the most competent staff of any newspaper in the world. They can certainly carry on for a year without you. Incredible things may happen in a year. How can I expect our staff to carry on when they crawl like children? Please don't get excited, Mr. Pulitzer. Well, I can't stay away a full year. Unless you submit to the doctor's orders, it may be much longer. Now let me see the cablegram again. Yes, sir. I must dictate a reply. Oh, whatever is the matter with me? I can't see the writing. Confound this country and its sudden twilights anyway. Twilight? Certainly. Dusk in the middle of the day. Why, it's still bright daylight, Mr. Pulitzer. You must have... Anthony, you'd better call the hotel physician. I... I must have strained my eyes. <laughs> Is that Italian doctor, Kate? He's in consultation with a specialist. Oh, oh, why must they fire those plastic guns? It's the Italian artillery at practice, just outside Naples. Yeah, with my head as a target. Every shell is bursting in my brain. Ponsonby is endeavoring to have it stopped. What do the doctors say? They they say you must reconcile yourself to to a long restaurant. And just how do they propose that I direct my newspaper? Joseph, the world to itself. Your job now is to take care only of yourself. Kate, I want the truth. You may as well know, Joseph. Your condition isn't absolute blindness. Yet, yet unless you compose yourself, it will end in that. Blind, eh? Well, I shan't let it defeat me. I won't be tossed overboard. If I can't see for myself, I'll make others see for me. Nothing can stop me. There's too much ahead. No, Joseph. Nothing must ever stop you. You've half your life ahead. And so many of us to guide. Oh. Here's Mr. Ponsonby. Ah, the firing has ceased. What a relief. Is this your doing, Ponsonby? Just a little wire pulling. After all, the Italian government is quite aware of your importance. Ponsonby, I just got the truth out of Mrs. Bulletin. About the blindness. Oh, I'm... Being matters. The thing for me to do now is to plan how to do without sight. I'll need more secretaries. I am going to prove that I can direct the New York world even if I can't be at my office. Oh, Kate. I'm afraid this is going to be hardest on you, tied down to a helpless blind man. If you're helpless, what about the rest of us? We'll travel, Joseph, and I'll be your eyes. With a yacht. We might do it. Yeah. Ah, I'm afraid the noise, the heat, and the cold of New York would be too much for me. Ah, and now, Punsonby, suppose we get to work on those letters. You're wonderful, Mr. Pulitzer. Simply amazing. Ah, rubbish. Even if I can't see, I can still think. <laughs> For 24 years, Pulitzer continued at long range to direct his devastating fire against governmental corruption, prejudice, and falsity. Crossing and recrossing the Atlantic, cruising along Mediterranean shores in his palatial yacht Liberty, on which he made his permanent home, he continued his amazing career. Pulitzer's fortune grew, and as it did, his benefactions, usually secret, grew in number. One plan in particular lay very close to his heart and commanded his deepest interest. He is discussing it now with Mrs. Ulitzer while cruising the Mediterranean. The trustees of Columbia University have at last agreed about my plan for creating a school of journalism. Agreed? I should think they might. Two million dollars. Yes, I'm firmly convinced that before this century closes, colleges of journalism will be accepted as a feature of specialized higher education. Here is Mr. Ponsonby, Joseph. Oh. 
You have the memorandum completed, Bunsenby? Yes. This is something I have decided to include in my will, Kate. Oh. An idea I had in conjunction with founding the School of Journalism. It's a series of prizes in the interests of letters and good newspaper work. Yeah. To be awarded in America, of course. In fact, an incentive to Americanism. There are to be substantial awards for newspaper work, novel, biography, a book of poems, history, and so on. Joseph, this is the finest thing you've ever done. You see, Ponsonby, when I was a young man, there was one time when I was badly in need of a helping hand. Someone to point away. Well, that aid was given to me. Oh, but you really needed no help, Mr. Pulitzer. Everyone needs encouragement at some time or other. Otherwise, the creative spirit in many of us languishes and dies. I believe in giving a hand, particularly to youth. In their ideas lies the salvation not only of the press, but of our country, the world, and all civilization. If I can help fan the creative spark into flame, I shall feel that I have not lived in vain. Death claimed the Payne Rack publisher October 29th, 1911. During all but four of his 28 years of proprietorship of the world, he was an invalid, and most of the time he was blind. Yet, to the very end, he was true to the pledge of Thomas Jefferson, his idol. I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Joseph Pulitzer, champion of freedom, crusader for justice, humanitarian, was truly a captain of industry.